if you have an idea, just do it. I think it's so important. Otherwise, we're just sitting. What are we doing? Otherwise, we're just sitting around. Nothing's getting done. No joy is being created. Welcome to Hack Circus. This week I talked to Rodri Marsden. Rodri, you may know from Twitter, he's got about 40,000 followers on there, so it's, chances are you probably follow him already. He's a journalist, he writes for major publications and online, and he writes features, and we talk about that a bit in this episode. He's also very funny, he writes really, really good, well-crafted, very sort of dry tweets and Instagram posts. And he's also an excellent musician. I would say that counts as pretty creative, but we do discuss this in the episode. See what you think when you've listened to him talk on this show. I've known Rodri for quite a few years now. I think I first came across him when he emailed me after reading an online magazine I used to do. If you've been listening to this show for a while, you'll be getting the sense that I have always made things like this, radio things and online magazines and anything that brings people together to make something that's greater than the individual could do on their own, I guess. Anyway, I recognised Rodri's name when he got in touch with me and uh, looked him up. And this was back in 2007, which was pre-Twitter, actually. So I don't know where I'd come across him before, perhaps in his column in The Independent about technology. But he's also in the band Scritty Politi, which you've almost certainly heard of. He plays keyboards for them. And he's in a band called Dream Themes, and we talk about that also in this episode. Dream Themes play covers of TV theme tunes uh, at events and weddings and things like that. But they originated as the band for Frank Sidebottom. So Rodri's, Rodri's got all these amazing connections and has just had this really interesting career in life, I think. So I, I really hope you enjoy this one. I think you will. If you do, please give us a quick rating on iTunes. Uh, it only takes a second to hit those stars. If you have more than a second, a review as well. You'd be creative. It's a fun opportunity to do a little bit of writing. Think of it that way. If you want to get in touch, we're on all the social media, at Hack Circus, basically Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, IRC. We have an IRC channel that's always got some chat going on in it. So just however you want to get in touch, do so. And it's always a pleasure to hear from you. Let's get on with it, shall we? Rodri Marsden. Music industry that it may it may have changed now, but you know a few years ago you, there was always this talk of like ten thousand albums. A, a bigish band or a band that you've heard of can sell ten thousand albums, but getting beyond that, right. do you know what I mean? It's like it's like kind of bursting through a dam or something. And once you get past ten thousand, you suddenly go kind of stratospheric right. but you have to get past 10,000 albums and no one can so it's like it's like our 150 I mean I'm kind of kind of similar to you in that regard you know like well a, a number of bands that I play in uh, yeah it's about 150 isn't it <laughs> so who are these people it's the same 150 people it could, show be. Up. It could be but you do have a, a big Twitter following um, which you've kind of accumulated over the years were you an early Twitter adopter yeah, yeah. I think I think that's the main reason Really, it's, it, it, I think it's kind of a consequence of being there very near the beginning, and well, being consistently good as well. Like you never sort of flaked off or um, or had a go at your listeners or your your followers, which I always hate. I think the only way I can maintain my sanity on that platform is just by just keeping it light. Do you know what I mean? I can't, I can't bear, I can't bear arguments. I can't bear, you know, falling out with people. I mean, there's plenty of people on there who just, who, you know, they get they get so riled so easily, and I just kind of think, oh. But of course, it's um, and there's a lot of anger on there. It's quite weird being part of a kind of liberal media bubble that I, I'm sure that me, me and you are in. Unless, unless <laughs> maybe, you, maybe you aren't. I mean, I, I, I've not been in your bubble, but I, I'm just, our, our bubbles intersect. Yeah. And and of course, it's so weird at the moment because you know, just everyone's just what's going on. You know, literally every other post is like, what is happening? What is happening? And actually, to preserve your mental health you've just got to kind of step away from it and and actually being frivolous feels a bit feels a bit odd you know yeah. it's like, am, am I allowed to, am I allowed to still post inconsequential stuff about 
you know, some cables that are sticking out of the ground <laughs> and people are tripping over them near where I live, you know, that's one I would normally do, like, that there are some cables sticking out of the ground. Yeah, I saw this. Yeah, yeah you saw yeah. it. Yeah. I feel like it's even more important, though, at this, at this time to post that kind of stuff. The small stuff. So, yeah, well, I, I follow <laughs> Harry Hill on Instagram, and all right. he posts is, like, pictures of, like, mattresses people have left out in the street. Yeah. And every time I see one, it's so joyful. <laughs> it's yeah. like, yeah, good for you, You're keeping that going. Like, that's, if that's your role, you know, in, in this social media bubble to yeah. be that guy I think it's fine yeah. um, but do you feel like that the, you talked about anxiety and um, and I know that you have I mean we can talk about this on the podcast but we're talking about as, my mental health on we a podcast. all have mental health <laughs> issues and especially those of us on the internet too much but do you feel like current events and reading about this, this stuff on the online all the time makes it worse? Oh, yeah, uh, unquestionably, yeah. unquestionably. It's like this morning, I mean, I've only posted one tweet today and it was something like, w- woke up at 6am and read several dozen <laughs> traumatic news articles, you know, and now I'm set up for the day ahead, you know, and that's, that's kind of what it feels like. And of course the solution is... Just, just, just don't look. But it's quite. I mean, especially when you actually when you're freelance and you, you spend a lot of time at home on your own <laughs> during the day and in the evening. It's like you know, social media traditionally has been something of a kind of a you know a lifeline, a bit of a godsend in that in that regard. You do feel that you're part of a little community and you're exchanging ideas or jokes or inconsequentia. And then when a bunch of arseholes turn up and ruin it, it's, uh, you know, it feels like. But of course, it's not ours. It's not, it's not ours to control the way the way it's used. And oh, actually, one of the most one of the things that annoys me most about Twitter is people just kind of telling other people how they should be using the platform. It's like, would everyone please stop tweeting about tennis? <laughs> what, do, what are you on about? What are you on about? Stop tweeting about tennis. I, I, I don't even know how to respond to that other, other than just it's just jaw dropping. Co- connected to that whole thing about f- numbers of followers is that is the just the idea of self-promotion I don't know how self-promotion sits with you as a yeah. I mean I, I find it kind of troubling I'm kind of suspicious of ambition and, it's, it's, and, and again that's a curious thing to I think that's why you do have followers though because people like that about you because it, people don't like it because it does come across that you're not sort of self-aggrandising yeah although I mean I mean, but you, I mean you can come out of it either way looking like a wanker you know? it's, 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 it's difficult and also it's very difficult to talk about without actually singling out specific people as, as illustrating I don't really want to do that but you know there, but there is uh, I don't know the, the, pursuit, the pursuit of the pursuit of retweets and likes and um I don't know, it's, it, but it's, but, but you know, I'm a, but I'm a freelancer and I'm working the media, and 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 obviously the number of Twitter followers that one has, it does does kind of have an effect. You know, there's no doubt that I've got work because of that. Yes. Uh, at, at, until such point that it's been, it was realised that, that, that having that many Twitter followers doesn't actually mean a great deal in terms of you know amplification, or doesn't doesn't necessarily. You know, it might do or it might not do, but it's it's certainly no guarantee. You know, and of course there's a lot of people who are kind of very ambitious, doing really well, and I feel. I kind of feel leapfrogged sometimes, you know, by obviously like just just people who are hungrier than I am, and I, and and who are brilliant, and that's kind of great. But it's quite quite strange to kind of watch it, watch it happening, you know. I suppose all of our careers have a have a kind of undulatory kind of quality to them, and sometimes you're doing well, and sometimes you're not doing so well, and it's yeah. I suppose I'd pretend that I'm not affected by that, but I suppose <laughs> you, you can't you can't help but be affected by it. Yeah, yeah, and and being online so much, you're so aware of what your your peers are doing. It's quite hard to get away from. That. But it's also the thing of being kind of visible and active. We all know the amount of kind of time and effort and brain power it takes to kind of come up with stuff, and that does not sit very well with spending all your time on Facebook and Twitter and so ideally for certain projects you would just disappear for, you should just disappear for, for three months but then you, dis, you, know, you disappear and you think oh god no, people, people will be forgetting that I exist you yeah, know. yeah. and of course they don't you, you know, but, it's, but it's very hard to remember that you know you might I know there are periods of time where I've been writing a book or something where I haven't like write, written anything for newspapers or magazines for like a, for that period of time, and you're, you're sweating about it. You're thinking, "Oh God, well, look, I, I'm yesterday's man." And of course, you you email them, "Hi, it's me again." And they were like, "Oh yeah, hi." Like they, they, they don't keep tabs on how long it's been since you've emailed them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's maybe that's maybe that's just me because I, I mean I, I worry about all kinds of stuff. Yeah, and well, I think it's partly as well because you have 
like you say, you, you do different kinds of projects, which is one of the things I wanted to talk about. So yeah. you, you might you might disappear from journalism for a while to write a book or to you know, do some music thing or something. Um, you're had, laughing as you. Well, no, no, no. I, it, it, just because something funny happened on Friday, which is I got I, I got an email from a PR about about some the launch of some kind of techie stuff or I don't, I don't know what it was actually but the subject line of the email was do you even write anything anymore oh no <laughs> I, know. Oh. I was thinking what a, what a way to approach <laughs> someone who you on, you're trying to get coverage from do you even write anything anymore I'm like what are you talking about oh my god well no, not what are you talking about but how funny it is that that's the perception you know I'm thinking I've been really busy I've done something for the economist I've been writing for the guardian I've been doing all this stuff and yeah <laughs> That, that, yeah, that kind of that kind of upset me, but made me kind of laugh at the same time. It's so funny. Maybe that's partly a consequence of like the independent kind of folding, I suppose. Oh, yeah. uh, the print edition folding earlier this year. I'd be writing kind of five or six things a week for them, like punting wow. it out there, boom, 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 boom. It, it, it's been very strange to watch the independent uh, change. And basically, I'm a feature writer. So, you know, I, I like writing. I like writing stories, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 words about a thing. Have you, where have you found a home for features then? Have you, have you, you said you wrote something for The Economist. Yeah, I've done Guardian. some stuff for The Economist, the um, magazine that comes with The Economist, done stuff for, yeah, for The Guardian, for um, Mosaic, who are funded by the Wellcome Trust. Okay. I did, a, I did a big thing for them about male pattern baldness. Oh, right. Like a kind of 5,000 word yeah. piece that took me like a month. Just investigating, I mean, it's an incredibly strange world. I mean, you, you, you are not a bald man, or indeed a bald, or indeed a bald woman. But if you if you were, and you were worried about such things, and you went online to, to investigate the options for perhaps remedying this situation, you would be confronted with this extraordinary range of options from you know from medicines to wigs to balms to balsams to transplants, all kind of all kind of preying on male anxiety so that's, that's a really interesting thing I did for them if anyone's listening and wants a uh, features writer in touch with Audrey there you go hawking my ass on your podcast absolutely I guess a bit more that's a bit more up- uplifting me after the decline of paper media if you like um, one of the things I really like about you Audrey is mm. that you do experiments with music and then you share them straight away online and you'll just kind of go and work out a song or a bit of a song and yeah. share it and it's so joyful um, and so like to you it's just kind of oh it's just what I do but I think to a lot of people it's really impressive um, and I suppose that's a positive use of social media as well you can kind of go off and share it with everybody straight away this lovely thing you've made I've always been really fascinated in the way that pop music just is just put together and assembled. And like when I was, you know, when I was 10, 11, 12, I'd be you know, trying to work, you know, work songs out on the piano. Like, oh, oh my God, that, that that way that the verse goes into the chorus is amazing. How do they do that? And and I'm st- and I remember um, I remember I was when I was at school about 13 years old. They got a bunch of music technology in, like four track recorders and stuff. And I was absolutely. <gasps> Just like oh my God, you can you can you know you can record your own stuff. Like I can record a, a I can record a thing, and then I can put something on top and mix it together. You know, this was you know wow, and I can do it in, in this room here. And I remember going to a room and working out. <laughs> it was called oh oh um, the Human League, Louise, song by the Human League. And I remember going into a little room on my own and kind of just putting or playing all the parts in, and I, I found it absolutely just kind of joyful just to hear just to recreate it and, and I still like that it's like, it's like my favourite little thing to do it's like perhaps the only thing I do to relax is just think okay what am I going to uh, what am I going to work out what am I going to investigate and it, I don't know it's not really creativity is it it's a kind of I was thinking about this because obviously I knew I was going to come here and talk to you about being creative and I just think I just think I'm more I'm just a bit more admin you know I just it's think, so I think, ridiculous, though. Like, I think I know you think that about yourself, but I think that anyone who knows you or seen the things that you do would say differently because because the projects that you do are like are really artistic. Like, you do, you know, you you're always playing music. You're, you're you have a particular writing style that's you know funny and dry and everything else. It's not you don't just kind of process information in a cold way. Your personality comes into everything you do. <laughs> Yeah, but 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 that but that creativity is. I mean, musically speaking, I've I've just been lucky in that 
I mean, over the years, basically, I felt like I've been just sat in the passenger seat while some kind of mad bastard is driving this this vehicle, and I'm kind of telling them where to go. You know, it feels like a kind of a support role. Playing in dream themes, we do TV. This band that does covers of TV themes, like weddings and festivals and stuff. But that's, it wasn't my idea. You know, it, my, my, my friend Paul had the idea, and I was just, I was just like, yes. And then I just channel all my energy into kind of like, okay, well, how are we going to make that happen? You know, what, how is how are we going to do this? You know, and, and that's the, I get that joy out of just making making stuff happen. And it's the same with Scritty Politics. Like Green wanted to do gigs, it was like, how are we going to play these songs with these resources that we've got? So it's like a problem. It's like a logic problem, okay. or a kind of yeah, you yeah. know, it's that kind of admin thing. But even with writing, you know, it's like I've never, I can't write fiction. I just I just don't have. I suppose you know, creativity is often equated with imagination. I don't really feel like I have a great imagination. And I, but ask me to look into a subject and find out about it, and then tell you it in the in the, in the clearest way possible. Then I, I feel like I'm really good at that. Yeah. So, so, communication and maybe, yeah, processing. Yeah, it's funny. I, I mean, I just get just the thing I get distracted by at home when I'm working is not like idle thoughts about you know art or literature. You know, it's admin. I just I just like doing my accounts. You know, I like order. Do you know? <laughs> Right. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, so it's um, it's strange. I have a certain role in in bands that I play in, and then I might go to a um, yeah, I might go to a gig and, and see a woman up on stage in some huge diaphanous gown, kind of screeching into a microphone, and I'm kind of thinking, wow, you know, that's really. Now that's what real kind of creativity is about. Real, just not giving a shit. Right, it's just, like just uninhibited yeah, I mean, emotion. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, just and then and the expression thereof. And I, and I, that's not really. I don't express uninhibited emotion. <laughs> I produce carefully controlled <laughs> nuggets of stuff. By the time this goes out, people listeners will already know that a previous episode was Neil Malarkey from the Comedy Store Players. And Neil used to go to loads of gigs in his mm. youth, uh, which was kind of the early eighties. And I said to him, were you a punk? And he said, um, and you probably weren't old enough to be. No. Neil's quite a lot, lot older than both of us. No offence to Neil, but I think he knows that you. But, um, yeah, so he was he was about the right age. And, and he said I was a Saturday punk. He said I, I used right. to put all my stuff in the in my bag and go to a party on Saturday and get changed. Yeah. <laughs> Which I guess is quite common. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I was a kind of... I wasn't even a Saturday goth. I think being a goth was kind of what I wanted to be. Mm. You know, I was 12, 13, 14. I was, I was kind of strangely obsessed with The Cure for, like, t- for two years. And I think I probably wanted to be Robert Smith. And I think Robert Smith is one of those people who, you know, if I met, I would genuinely feel a bit kind of kind of dumbstruck. Not because I... I, I mean, after about 1989, I had no interest in The Cure whatsoever. But, he, I, but he, the power of that is still retained. Um... And uh, but I, yeah, I kind of wanted to be a wanted to be a goth. When I see people dressing exotically in black gear now, I still I still think, oh yeah, you look great. You know, I, I kind of I kind of wish I had some of that kind of doom. You are wearing every time I see you, you are wearing all black. Is that is that a deliberate? Well, actually, well no, it, it's 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 not. It's na- it's actually navy. But I I, I I do wear the same I do wear the same thing every day. I have yeah, it's like an Eric Sarty thing. You know, he had you know he had you know. What did he have? He had seven identical right. turquoise suits or something, velvet suits. Einstein was I just another have, one. And I just, uh, yeah, yeah, I just, I don't know. I, I don't know. Do you think it helps your personal brand? I've been worried about my personal brand. I've been thinking maybe <laughs> I should wear... One of my ideas was wear all one colour yeah. <laughs> all the time. It doesn't matter what colour. No, as long as it's one toe. colour. Yeah. yeah. You'd end up in trouble if you adopted that approach. You know, they were, you'd, you'd, you'd have a top but no, but not bottoms. You know, it, 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 you'd, have to, you'd have to think ahead about your wash cycle. Yeah, you know. hard. I have a strange relationship with clothes. It's, it's, it's partly to do with being a bit overweight, you know, and I've been this I've been this size ever since I was like not this size, but this shape ever since I was one year old. <laughs> so uh, accelerated baby. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Yeah. You just end up wearing stuff you feel vaguely comfortable with and say, okay, I'll stick with this now. I remember when we first got in touch, it was because I used... I don't know who was our mutual contact, but I used to make a magazine, which, again, had about 150 people. We used to read it. I love online, those guys. I know, <laughs> yeah, an online PDF magazine, and it was, at least initially, about sort of an alternative approach to fashion. And Rodri 
read it and emailed me, and that was the first time we had any contact. You said something complimentary about my writing or something, and I recognised mm. your name, and I kind of Googled you, and was like, mm. wow, it's Roger Marsden from Scritty Police. <laughs> and I was really excited. And then I, obviously, as I always do with anyone of note who I meet, I immediately ask you to write something for yeah. me. And you wrote what did something. I write? You wrote something about men's fashion, I think. And I remember wow. you said something about muffin tops and a way of hiding muffin tops and eating muffin tops. There was some sort of clever muffin top was there? joke. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, it feels slightly excruciating now. You're feeling it back to me. <laughs> it's like I, I don't know. I don't know. I would have got away with that, or indeed made it any good. But, um, but there you go. I don't remember that. No, it was very sweet. I, yeah. I, don't, I, forget, I forget so quickly. It was like, a long time ago, though. It was. It was about 2007, something mm. like that. Yeah. So. I forget. I forget immediately. I forgot what I, I forget what I wrote, wrote last week. It's just just like in in one eye out there. But you must write so much though as well. Do you feel like you're writing thousands of words a week? Well, um, less so now, just because I'm just I'm just writing less than I used to. But for the indie, it would just genuinely be like, you know, 700 words about the speaking clock by 4 p.m. Yes, okay. The next day, you know, could you write something about? Um, um, the, the things that Olympians listen to on their on their headphones, yeah, by you know, by four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You turn it out, and I genuinely wouldn't be able to tell you anything about about it the next day. Did I you enjoy it? Did you? Because I feel like that would be quite exciting. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. I loved that. Um, the first thing they, one of the first things the indie ever got me to do, there was a, there's an author called Robert Chalmers. It was great, and he worked. For, he worked for the Independent, but he, he great novelist. And he decided to promote his latest book by giving away copies on the streets of... It was Otley, Otley in West Yorkshire. And I, there was a reason why he chose Otley, and I can't remember, I can't remember why it was. But anyway, so this, this gig involved, involved me going up to Otley, getting there early, and then spending the day with him, like, going with, wandering around Otley with him and a few of his friends, just like, as he gave, tried, to, tried to give away books to people who evidently didn't want, want them and found, found it all a bit suspicious. And then I had to file 2,000 words by 6pm. Like, so it was all like, I oh, know, and, and I absolutely... And I, and I was, you know, I spent the whole day thinking, oh my God, how am I going to do it? How am I going to do it? How am I going to do it? And, um, and I did it. And I remember feeling... So, I remember filing on the train on the way home, just like pressing send and thinking, I'm, I'm, a, real, I'm a real journalist now. <laughs> Even though I'm just reporting on some guy giving away books. One well, not a real journalist, never was. But I, yeah, I did like that. Yeah. I did like that kind of excitement of feeling like you're up against it and then pulling it off. I'm quite envious. I wish I had um, somebody that was demanding things of me on a regular basis. Deadlines are tricky, aren't they? Yeah. For, me, I, for me, I'm like... If it's something that I've not been asked to do and it's something that I'm just doing for myself, I just have a real impatience about getting it finished. I kind of just want to get it done and kind of get it out there. I mean, just, just finish it, finish it and move on. But of course, there are a lot of people who I know who just who find it incredibly difficult to just to, to, you know, they have completion anxiety, basically. Right. You know, like, I can't, I want to keep crafting this and working on this until it's until it's ready, oh, for, yes. yeah. and ready for a public consumption and... Um, I think that can be quite destructive. I, I feel like the podcasting community, for example, is quite tolerant of things being turned around quite quickly, and mm. they'd rather have something to listen to than something that sounds like, you know, it's been made by a Radio 4 producer. Yeah. So, and, that's part, and, of, the, and that's part of the charm of the genre, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, I think so. So so I don't... As long as it's edited well enough, it's not just completely... Which I hate, just podcasts that are completely unedited. Can't stand that. Mm. And yeah, and it's on a schedule. But I guess it, you don't have that problem of waiting until something's exactly right before you release it. Yeah, you were saying you, you do it quickly and get it out there as soon as well, you can. In, in, yeah. t- in terms of music, I was always, you know, whenever I've made my own music, I've always just, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that'll do, that'll do. Right. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's not a perfectionist thing. It's a kind of there's an excitement with seeing something come together. I think I'm really, probably really fascinated by a certain part of the process. It's the same with writing, actually. My favourite bit. My favourite. <laughs> My favourite bit of writing is just like I've got I've got like you know like eight pages of notes, mm. and then I, you know it's that and it's that it's that dirty, first dirty draft or whatever they call it. Do you know what I mean? Where you're just hammering out yeah. barely formed sentences, but you're but the kind of the thread of your argument is kind of crystallising and, mm. and becoming clear. You know, you're thinking, oh yeah, that bit goes bit into that bit, and that bit goes into that bit, and that, that's you know, that's the exciting bit for me. And then the actual going through it and like and realising that I've used the same word three times in one paragraph, and then having to think of an alternative. That stuff is just like, oh, kind of a bit, a bit, a bit of a drag. But the actual, 
you know, the, yeah, the crystallising of, of the idea is really exciting. It's the same with music. When, as, I, as I can hear it come together, I'm thinking, yeah, these are how all the bits slot together, and then the finessing is like, ah, on, do we really have to do this bit? <laughs> what um, instruments do you play? What instruments do I play? Uh, keyboard. I play, saw. yeah, I play keyboard, musical saw. I play the bassoon. The bassoon was my instrument when I was at school. Um, yeah, guitar-y, bassy stuff. You know, um, that's about it. Were you prodigiously musical at school? Did you do a? I started. Grade learned, eight? Yeah, I did all the, I did all my grades on piano and bassoon, and uh, yeah, I started learning piano really, really young. And bassoon when I was pretty young too. Could, could barely stretch my hands around anything. Um, I don't know. It's um, it's it's, a, it's curious to, to have all of that th- theory in your head when quite often uh, over the years I've been making music, you have to kind of try and forget it all in order to come up with something decent, half decent. Does that make sense? So it's like even if I, if I try and write music now, I find myself falling into kind of patterns. Of, you know, you have an idea in your ha- your head about the way music should go or the way things should resolve, and actually, you know, you'd be, you'd be far better if you just didn't have that knowledge and you were just given an instrument you couldn't really play and just asked to, you know, and asked to try and make something interesting with it. I like writing on Facebook, like kind of longish posts, not long, you know, like like two hundred, three hundred word things. Just about just doing you know inconsequ- inconsequential stuff, and I and I like the flow of that. I like the way that I'm typing like I would talk to you. I like the fact that I use the word kinder a lot. Mm. You know, I, I, that's, it just feels real to me. It doesn't. I don't need to go back and kind of sculpt it into a thing. It's just like this kind of kind of quite honest splurge. So, so I, th- I think you're more. Um, you say you're not creative. I think maybe you're more performative. Than okay. Anything else. Whenever I write anything, even even like, you know. <laughs> feature for a magazine or a newspaper I, I the last thing I do is just sit there and just read it out loud to myself I don't know whether that's a normal thing to do yeah, but I kind of think that but quite often I'll be reading it out loud and I'm thinking I wouldn't say that to someone that's ridiculous and then, and then, and then I change it the other day I saw I saw on Twitter someone link to an open letter that they'd written to I won't say who it's to but to a, a, a public figure I, I'm yeah, they just said I, it's time. I think it's time that I reposted this open letter I've I've written to this person, and they posted it. And I, <laughs> I went and read it. It was so so absurd. Like the language that's used in open letters, it's so incredibly pompous. You know, yes. dear so and so. There's a style. <laughs> I know, and it's so funny. That's so funny. I'm just like I would really, really, really like to watch them read it out and not and not kind of flinch or wince. And I can't. I mean, maybe they wouldn't. I don't know. But I, I'm wincing as I'm as I'm reading it. I'm thinking, oh wow, oh my god. <laughs> Uh, and I can't even give an example of, of what I'm talking about, but you, you know, yeah, what, I know, you know exactly what you know what I mean. mean. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's definitely a thing. It's it's such a curious genre, isn't it? Yeah. That, you know, you're, you're addressing someone with a knowledge that <laughs> there's it's a bunch so of other people reading. It's so it. passive aggressive as well. Like. <laughs> <laughs> you used to write for the Independent, and it was like a, one of the things you used to do was a technology clinic column. Yeah. Do you actually? have any interest in technology I mean not in, a, not in an offensive way but it's not something I've ever picked up from you particularly like you haven't sort of gone oh what what phone I operating system have you got or mm. um, started talking to me about laptops or anything and, it, and you don't necessarily seem like the kind of person who would be into that stuff when I was 10 I got I had a ZX81 computer and I became absolutely consumed with that I found it absolutely mm. Extraordinary that I had the the ability to, to play a terrible game of pinball on a TV in my in my own home and I, and and then but then I yeah then I kind of lost interest in computers for for ages for like ten years and then when I got my first job coming out of university I worked in I worked in a, a small company music business company and um, but the guy who ran that company was a real kind of techie guy. I mean, he, he had he had Max. He you know he was using email before anyone was using email. We had the internet in the office like before anyone knew what the internet was. Not anyone, but you know before most people did. And uh, and that was the point where I started kind of getting in, getting back into it. You know, and I'm not I'm not um, I don't know loads about it, but I am really interested in it. I think that's why, I think that's kind of why the Independent wanted me to do it. Because I think they found that, that when they got people who were really, really into technology to write about technology, that the, the way in which they wrote about it just it just immediately excluded 
people from the conversation, or they just uh, people people were just like, well, I don't know what you're on about. Yeah. And I think they found that I was. I got so what happened was I got a call from I just got a call from the Independent one day. Literally, the features, the features editor of the Independent saying, "Hi, Roger. Look, do you know what MP3 is?" And this was—I don't know—I don't, know, don't know when this was. This would have been 2002, well, maybe. Yeah. 2003. Do you know what MP3 is? I was like, "Yeah." So and they said, "Oh, thank God. We know, no one here does. Could you write this thing for us?" And I was like, "Yeah." And they and they really liked it. So that's how I became. That's effectively how I became the technology columnist for the Independent. I knew I knew what an MP3 was at the right moment in time. A safe pair of hands, I think. Yeah. I mean, I'm fairly embarrassed about it because you know it's like I, obviously I don't write for Wired. I don't have that immersion in technology or that perhaps that level of interest in technology. But I do. I do. I do buy stuff and I do. I do read about it and I do. <laughs> I feel, I, feel, I feel like I'm kind of apologising. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of a strange position to that, that you've put me in there. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. No, I kind, I kind of mean it in a good way because, like, you have you have the interest, but you're also, like you say, you're able to bridge that interest with other people. Yeah. It's funny the the, guy, the the job I was just talking about with this guy. It was just me. It was just me and a guy. It was me and guy in his house for like ten years, just just doing music management. And we, we used to uh, arrange. We used to work with Eastern European concert promoters, and we used to take bands to Latvia, Lithuania, Siberia, Bulgaria. Um, and I was all about logistics and you know making sure everything went smoothly. It was a great job, very stressful. But the guy, the, the guy who I worked for, a guy called Nick, he was. Uh, he was really into technology, and that had a real kind of influence on me. I don't, I don't, I beca- actually, I ended up becoming the person who sorts everyone's computers out. His computer would break down, and then I, you know, I just basically learned, or I, you know, I know how to sort this out. So he imparted that interest in technology. He also, he was all about clarity of communication. It was all about like, if you don't say exactly what needs to be said in this fax or, the, or this email you know the whole the whole show could just fall apart you have to be you have to cover all bases you have to and you have to say exactly what needs to be said you know and he was absolutely stickler for it and he'd go through the letters that I'd written or the faxes that I'd written and he'd say no 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 and he'd make me do it again and I think that definitely had a, an effect on me as well just that just being able to communicate just just trying to communicate clearly you know and the third thing that he uh, he really <laughs> he was all about was just You've got to spend whatever money needs to be spent on something in order to make it happen. Just worry about worry about it later. Do you know what I mean? His creative projects that he was working on, he was just like, look, if we need to if we need to spend the money, it's just spend the money because otherwise it won't happen, and we'd just be sitting here, kind of getting upset about the fact that we weren't able to do it. So what, by whatever means necessary, let's just let's just make this happen. I retain. I'm not quite as spendthrift as him, but um, it's not the right word, spendthrift. I don't know. I always get confused whether that's. Way, I know, me neither. Is that funny? <laughs> I don't splurge as much money as he used to, but I still have that kind of. You just got to do it, and again, that kind of ties back to that thing of what you were saying at the beginning. Really important to do pointless stuff, whatever the yeah. emotional, financial cost. <laughs> you know, just 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 do it. If you have an idea, just do it. I think it's so important. Otherwise, we're just sitting. What are we doing? Otherwise, we're just sitting around. Nothing's getting done. No joy is being created. Yeah, and it, and it's kind of taking things into your own hands as well, which I, I kind of relate to. And I, I think like you can't get to a place like you are in your career now without deciding that you're going to be the one that makes it happen a lot of the time. So you have to say, I, I want to write an article about this or I want to meet that journalist or whatever. And then just, you, rather than just sitting around for 10 years waiting for them to email you, you've yeah. got to go out there and get it, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think, I don't know, obviously it's a curious age now because the notion of creativity is being sold to us by every technology company. It's like, create, create with this, create with this. You can create, you can create. And of course, that's fantastic. Who, 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 who could say that that's not a good thing? Who would deny? Any human, you know, any human being, the, the the ability to create stuff. But of course, the the consequence of that is it just becomes much, much harder to be heard. Mm. And so, while in the past, I think a lot of people's creative zeal was probably driven by the idea of being noticed or being critically acclaimed or whatever. It's just like it's it's so hard to get there that I just think I think the whole purpose of creativity just, just has, you have to think about it in a different way. You just have to surround yourself with cool people who are going to do cool shit. Enjoy the process. Enjoy the process of making stuff. I think that's really, yeah, it's just doubly important. I've always been very obedient 
I think that's another factor. I just, well, just, I just, I just do, I just do what I'm told, and I, I file on time. Right. To the, to the, you know, in yeah. terms of writing, I file on time to the right length. Yeah. If something needs doing by a certain date, you can rely on me to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I'm kind of you know safe pair of hands. You know, yeah. Yeah. And it, but obviously a consequence of being a safe pair of hands is you end up being shat, shat on by <laughs> by people who just oh yeah, Roger will do it. I'll just leave that to him, right. and uh, you end up it could be becoming a bit of a safety net. Uh, God, I'm kind of confessing all kinds of stuff now. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that can get you quite far. Being the one person who does show up and does yeah. do the work. And, and I think, as I'm going to call myself a journalist for purposes, as journalists, we know what it's like and how actually how it's quite unusual to have people who are reliable and consistent. And yeah. I mean, I, I've never worked on editorial, but uh, you know, I, know, I know, know very well you know, people who do. And... Yeah, I'm, I'm always kind of baffled by the stories that they tell me about the, the sheer flakiness of, of, of people. I can't believe I was thinking, oh my God, you, you can actually be that flaky and still maintain a career. You know, you can yeah. still, you know, maybe that should be a lesson to me. Maybe I should just take my foot off the gas a little and not worry so much. You know, I still think that when a deadline's given to me, that they need it then. You know, they need it then. They don't. They've built in like days and days and days and days and days. And I'm just, oh no, no, they need it. They need it. They need it. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Just, no, no, they've, they're used to dealing with people who are a lot less conscientious than I am. Yeah, yeah. No, I always over commission by about a third mm. because stuff just doesn't show up. And, it, and it's my fault for not being able to pay anyone, of course, partly. But the ones who do get stuff in, you know are going to do well in life. Like, I always think that. Mm. If they bother to contribute to my magazine or they bother to send their photos from their new book to someone like me, then, like... But they care. They to, you know, there's a, yeah. yeah, they care enough about every bit of publicity or every opportunity. Yeah. Um, this kind of not being bothered thing leaks out into all the other areas. Yeah. You can easily talk yourself out of anything. Yeah. Don't, don't enter into a sexual relationship with those people. <laughs> yes. Whatever you do, I'm not. I wasn't advising you. I wasn't advising you not to have sex with your contributors. Anyway, sorry. When I was about 17, I went to a gig and saw this guy selling fanzines out of a bag, you know, and he just made his own fanzine, black and white photocopied thing, mm. and he was selling these for 50p. And I, and I bought one, and I was absolutely gobsmacked by this. It's a similar, it's a similar way to the to, to the whole thing about music. Oh, I can record my own thing. So it's like, oh my god, I can publish, I can I can write a thing, I can I can staple it together, and then sell it to, sell it to people in in pubs. Yeah, that's ridiculous. And I, I became utterly consumed by that, and I did my own, I did my own thing. I did two of those. About bands. About bands, yeah. And um, great. Do you still have any of them? Uh, yeah, I've got, I've got, I've got, well, I've got one of each. I did, I did two, I did two. One had a yellow cover and one had a blue cover. I sent one of them to John Peel, uh, who had a show on local radio. He did, a, he did a Sunday night local radio show in Bedfordshire, where I, where I grew up. And he, um, and I got a note from him in the post, like two days later, saying, "Hi, would you like to come on the show and talk about your, your fanzine?" And so my dad drove me. He, he, the John Peel recorded the show in Cambridge. In Cambridge, so my dad drove me up to Cambridge one Sunday night, and, I, and, uh, and so I sat across from my kind of one of my childhood heroes while he asked me about my magazine, and I was terrible. I was so nervous. Oh. Yeah, I mean I'm, I'm pretty incoherent now, but I was very very incoherent then. I do have a cassette of the whole interview, and I but I can't really listen to it. It's just too excruciating. But. Yeah, I wasn't. I don't think I was a particularly creative job, but at the same time, I was kind of throwing myself into kind of doing, mm. doing things, you know. Yeah, I, I've always made magazines and comics. Like mm. it's the thing that I've all, of all the things that I've tried out, it's the thing I've always felt I have to do. I've had a couple of years off doing something, or I've, like I, I'll do something for so long and I'll get frustrated that nobody's interested, and I'll just kind of close it down, um, or it'll get too expensive to do. And then like a year or two later I'll start another one up because I can't help it I think being in bands is the same thing for me yeah, yeah. I think the, the idea of like not lugging around a load of black boxes in the back of my car you know across town in the dead of night you know that would be weird if I wasn't doing that it would just feel right I've got to start something else I've yeah, got to, I've got yeah, to, yeah. I, I can't imagine not doing that my, 
my friend Paul, he used to put, he still does, puts on gigs in London, just kind of small, small bands, small venues. And he put on a show by Frank Sidebottom in London, and just as just as an idle question, he just said to Frank, Chris is the <laughs> Chris Seavey is the guy's real name. Sadly, no longer with us. But he asked Chris, he said, "Do you want to do? Do you want a band?" Because normally Frank would turn up with just a. He, he said, "I'll turn up with my keyboard and my head." Uh, he'd turn up with his keyboard and his head, uh, and so. But Paul said, "Oh, do you want to do you want to do it with a band? You know, I can put a band together." And so, because I'm, I'm old friends with Paul, he just said. That was the point at which Paul said, oh, God, we've got to do this. Can you help? So once again, I kind of stepped in and worked it out. And so, yeah, we did a load of gigs with him. And he was he was, uh, he was was an amazing man, really. Just that, no rehearsal, just no rehearsal. But you would go on stage and just know that it would be OK. I mean, obviously, I mean I've, I've seen Frank Sidebottom loads of times, and he, he, I've seen him give some, do some dreadful gigs. <laughs> But whenever, actually, whenever we went on stage, we kind of knew, well, we don't know what's going to happen, but whatever happens, it's not going to be boring. Yes. Or it's not going to be, you know, there's going to be something about it. You felt that you were kind of in safe hands, even though you weren't. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, we yeah we miss him terribly. We played with him at his, at his last London gig where he was obviously unwell. Oh, really? And, uh, yeah, it was a strange, a strange gig. But he gave it his all, even though he wasn't really eating. I mean, all, he, all he could consume was Lucozade at that point. It was a... Yeah, it was a bit, but of course you wouldn't know because he had his head on. He looked like death, but uh, but he had his head on and he went for it. It was great. And uh, and as and out of that out of that band came Dream Themes, this the TV um. Themes covers band because Frank used to he used to hold a raffle and then when he did the raffle when people came up <laughs> to claim their prize we would play a TV theme as a you know while they came up uh, Terry, Terry and June or whatever. <laughs> and uh, and then when Frank died, Paul said, "Why don't we just do this as a band?" Uh, so that's how that began. It lives on, yeah. The spirit of Frank lives on in that band. So with Dream Themes, yeah. if, if listeners want a band for their wedding, who can yeah. play the Quantum Leap theme tune, for yeah. example, and Terry and June, yeah. and I don't know what else. Well, we have it's a repertoire a of about 100. Amazing. Yeah. Love um, it. And we've done some amazing weddings where... <laughs> And the bride and groom want a TV theme for their first dance, you know. So it's kind of curious because obviously their themes are really short, you know. So we, we, we've done like countdown, we've done blockbusters for the first dance. For the first dance, yeah. Oh, yeah. Blockbusters for blockbusters for a bride and groom doing the actual, you know, the hand jivey dance that they, yeah. The, wor- the weirdest one we had was um, songs of praise. Someone said, "Look, can you do songs of praise?" They're a lovely, lovely couple. In fact, it's the best wedding we ever did. The gig was insane. It was so great. But they came, they came to me and said, "Look, um, yeah, we'd like songs, of, we'd like songs of praise." That was a bit of an odd, bit of an odd choice. It's not in our repertoire, but we're happy to kind of learn it for you. So I, I didn't, I didn't know the, the couple, and I wasn't sure whether they really knew what we were about. Which is basically, we're quite haphazard and we're quite loud, you know, and it's it's kind of rocky and you know, full on. So I sent them uh, an MP3 of my version of songs of the Songs of Praise theme. Which had quite, quite loud guitars in it. I thought I'll prep them for the for the full horror. And, uh, and they emailed back straight away, and they said, um, "This is fantastic. This is really great." But could you add the kind of flute bit in there because we do a little pirouette to that bit? And I was thinking, "Wow, they've choreographed their whole dance to songs of praise." And I was thinking, "Oh, this is going to be great," and it was. It was absolutely magical. It was great. Were they dancers or they just kind of no, no, they were no, they, dance, yeah. no, they. I mean, they weren't they weren't dancers at all, <laughs> but they were moving about in time to the music for songs of praise. And what a way to start married life. <laughs> I like the idea of a band that does weddings. Like, I, yeah, I like. I hardly ever go to weddings, but I always enjoy them. It's not. It's not always good. Oh, really? we, we've done some. Well, I, I mean, it's one of those curious things where you're you're a, you're in a band doing this rather unusual. Uh, you forget when you've been in bands for for as long as me. You forget that actually most people don't really ever see live music. That's not something that's part of their lives. And so when they see a live band in a hall at a wedding, and the, and the last live band they've seen was kind of six years ago at someone else's wedding, they just assume that you're going to be a, a standard wedding covers band. You're like you're going to be playing Cool and the Gang or you know Oops Upside Your Head or whatever. And um, and uh, and so we did this gig, and I'm, can't, I'm not going to say where it is. We did we did a gig where um, it was just amusement. It was a wedding, and it was just amusement. In, in the bride and groom were at the front and smiling, so we knew, oh, that's good. They, they're into it. That's all that matters. But behind them, there was just a kind of sea of confused faces. And then just to the left of the stage, there was a guy, a, a, a bald, angry man. He looked really angry, and he was standing just behind our bass player. And he looked, he looked furious. 
and uh, we finished, I don't know, Bergerac or whatever. <laughs> and, uh, and he just goes, Disco! Disco! He's hissing, Disco! Disco! And uh, this is a bit odd. So we played the next thing, Grange Hill or <laughs> whatever it was. And then, uh, and he, and, and then we turned around and he left, a, he left a note on top of the bass amplifier, shaky handwriting, just said Disco, underlined like three times. Mm-hmm. It's like he just didn't really... I was thinking this is, I, and I didn't. I don't like bad feeling, you know, yeah. in a room. It's bad. So I, we, we did. We did finish the. We finished the show. It was fine. And then I, I, I sought this guy out. I thought I just want to go and say hello to him. And I said, "Oh hi," and he, he said, "Hello." I said, "Yeah, I was in the, I was in the, I was in the band just then. I just wanted to explain something." I said, "You know, the, the Brian and Grimm hired us because we, you know, because we're a TV theme band. You know, we only play." TV themes, you know, that's why we didn't play disco music, because we only play TV themes. He said, you only play TV themes? I said, yeah, that's what we do. He said, that's all you do? And I was like, yeah, and he went, oh! So there's this kind of moment of realisation. He just watched us do an hour of TV themes. It was incredibly strange. Incredibly strange. They do go down really well, and it, I mean, the, the beauty of it is that it's really unusual now, even now, to hear a live band play, you know, the theme tune to So Want Me or whatever. Yeah, it's quite, very loud. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I just, I love the idea of it. It's yeah. very, it's very exuberant. It's the most, yeah. most joyous, it's the most yeah. joyous thing to do, it really is. And I can imagine the moment of recognition in the crowd, where yeah. they just kind of go, oh, it's that one. Yeah. yeah. Something they haven't heard for 20 years, perhaps. Exactly. But you do, yeah, you do genuinely feel as if you're giving people a good time which is not something I could say for every band that I've I've been in in the past Dream Themes are doing a a Christmas uh, show we do one every year at the Lexington in King's Cross but we're doing a panto this year oh wow yeah it's called Santa in Space (laughs) I play Baron Badman I'm the the, I don't know I'm some kind of character who doesn't like kids I, and I don't like kids. I do, I do like kids. I do, really. See, so yeah, Santa in space. I don't quite know what the story is. I, I think it involves Santa being lost in space. Right. Instead of delivering presents, he accidentally gets lost in space. Um, it will be rubbish. Is there music? Is there there will be mu- there will be music involved. I think. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm probably going to have to start working on that. It'll be 12 or 15 people on stage, not really knowing what they're doing, just messing about. Yeah, it'll be fun. Well, go to, do you know what the date is? It's, I think it's Friday the 19th of December. Yeah, very good. There is, you go. Is there a Dream Themes website? Dreamthemes.tv. Right. Although well, I said the dot twice, but don't put two dots. <laughs> Dreamthemes.tv. The dot, dot, the dot, <laughs> yeah. Dot, T-E-A. Yeah. T-E-A. Yeah. V-E-E. Yeah. And that's it for this week. I'll see you again on Monday for Creativity Clinic, as usual. Don't forget to rate, review, subscribe, etc. on iTunes. And if you really can't stand iTunes, then just tell someone about the show. Pass on the good news. And I'll see you again next week. 